everyone. <laughs> Welcome. I am just getting everything set up, but I'm super excited and so, so happy to that y'all are joining me and I get to share and serve y'all and um, get to y'all get to hear some funny stories about my rascals. <laughs> and I hope y'all share too and um, post in the comment box so I can see that y'all um, can relate to my crazy life. Okay, so I think... All right, so welcome everyone. We are live. Everything is working. If y'all could just post in the um, Q and A and our the chat and let me know that y'all can hear me, then I'll start. I don't want to start in y'all can't hear me, <laughs> and then it's just like, what happened? All right, awesome. So y'all can hear me. Wonderful. So I'm going to go ahead and begin. And I'm going to start with sharing some slides for y'all so that it's um, a little easier to follow along from what I found and to stay focused. Okay. Just give me a quick sec. All right, here we go. All right, so you guys should be able to see my screen. And I will be monitoring the chat as I go through the webinar. And any comments or questions, I'm going to actually take those at the end just so that I stay focused and I don't get shiny object <laughs> brain and everything that I say makes sense. So feel free to post your question in there. If you have a question or a comment, I will be looking at those as I go through the presentation. And then I'm going to come back to this to make sure that everybody gets heard and acknowledged. And I want to hear what y'all have to say. I want to hear y'all's feedback. So, um, so this parenting webinar today is for people whose goal is to discover new parenting skills. Maybe you, if you're a parent, <laughs> you know, you probably discovered that what works for your toddler isn't working for your preteen and what worked for your preteen isn't working for your teenager or your adult child you know and so as your child is going through different life stages we have to update that skill that we call parenting and um as you pro as you know relationships have this push me pull me type of cycle where there's a coming together and a breaking apart, a coming together and a breaking apart. And so deepening that connection with your child lets them know that no matter what, no matter what distance there is, no matter what life stage they're going through or you're going through as a parent, you love them, they're connected to you, you have their back. And as they go through these different life stages, you are teaching them how to be capable, how to be mature, how to be responsible, how to um, fix any mistakes that they've made because they're going to happen, right? And when you do that, you're teaching your child how to believe in themselves. And the, one of the main focuses today is on communication because when you recognize all the different ways that you're communicating with your child. And the big one that I'm going to talk about today is behavior, because behavior is a form of communication. When you learn how to interpret that, you can understand your child in a really new way that cements that bond that you have with them. They feel understood. They feel seen. They feel acknowledged. And as a parent, you feel capable. You feel like, yeah, I got this. I know what I'm doing, <laughs> right? And that's what I want for you, because Parenting isn't easy. You know, it's super challenging. You're constantly updating your skills. You're not getting credit for everything that you're doing. And it's a lot. And so this webinar is totally to support you and acknowledge you and to share new techniques with you. 
there's not going to be any judgment here. There's no criticism. I definitely have made mistakes. I'll be the first to admit that. And I will not be calling the kettle black, okay? That won't be me. So who am I? I have three rascals. I have a, I co-authored a book. It became the number one best-selling book on Amazon, and my chapter was over parenting. I'm a human design specialist. I'm a family coach facilitator. I'm a teacher and a speaker, and I believe that parenting is the most important job on the planet, and that's why I specialize working with families, parents, and children, because whenever you raise kids that are confident and that are capable, they're resistant to peer pressure. They have an inner knowing and they follow that and that is their guide throughout their life. And then they make decisions that are correct for them. So a little bit about my background. I'm born and raised in Texas. I live near Houston. And in 2009, I got divorced <laughs> and it was a horrible relationship. And as a single mom raising three kids, I wanted my kids to have a better relationship than I did. And I knew that meant me developing new skills that I had to teach them. And the way that parents teach is by setting an example and role modeling those skills. And so I knew that I had to find um, positive identities and confidence within myself that I could show and teach my children how to have. Because whenever you go through major life transitions like divorce, it creates instability, it creates insecurity. And so I wanted my kids to have a sense of confidence and stability that no matter what was going on around them, no matter what environment or situation they were in, there was a stability that they had. They had an inner voice and a confidence. They felt capable, and that would be their guiding force that would navigate them through, through life, <laughs> you know, through life. Um, I went back. I finished my bachelor's in psychology, and I got certified as a victim's outreach specialist, and I was working with the University of Texas a little bit whenever I was doing that, but it really taught me a lot about communication. But truly, my 19 years as a mom has given me the education and the dedication to support other parents in having a deeper connection with their children so that they experience more love, more joy in that relationship. Because it is a relationship that is, while super important, it also can be a struggle. It also can be difficult. You know, you're not going through the same thing. You know, you as a parent, you're going through a different life stage and life cycle than your child. And so having to juggle not only your life and your cycles with their life and their cycles, it can really be tricky. And so I know that through my work, children have four emotional needs. And when those needs don't get met, that's when a lot of chaos starts happening. And by the way, these emotional needs translate to adulthood also. So it's not just kids. You might find that some of the things I talk about, your partner does or a friend does or maybe even a coworker or a boss does. And this is also going to support you in those relationships. It can have all these ripple effects, right? And so when children don't understand or have the, vo the language, the vocabulary, or the understanding of what's going on inside them, they will use their behavior as their voice. And as they mature, if they never learn how to communicate and understand <laughs> their emotions, if they're constantly suppressing their emotions and hiding those things, then they continue to act out. And so my work really centers around pinpointing and identifying these behaviors and Showing parents that behavior, it all has a positive intent. And when you get to the intent of the behavior, that's whenever you truly support your child. That's whenever your child truly feels seen and recognized and valuable because you're giving them exactly what that need is. And then they don't have, then they're not misbehaving. Then a lot of the behavior problems that you are having they subside because your child learns how to talk to you and how to understand what's going on inside of them. So how does this apply to you? You may have noticed that, you know, the things that 
whenever your child, you know, was an infant, you know exactly what that cry meant. Okay, that cry means she's hungry. This cry means he needs a diaper change. This cry means he's sleepy. Let's get to it. And you had all, you knew exactly what to do and how to do it. And then as your child grew and started talking and walking, those things, you know, the things, you know, when, wait, you're sleepy, right? They weren't sleepy anymore. <laughs> or they weren't, hung, the, the way that they told you they were hungry changed. And so you, as a parent, have to change and evolve that parenting skill that you have. Because it can be incredibly confusing <laughs> if you have teenagers, you know, how confusing it can be and how the communication can have this huge gap in it. And so closing that gap will help form a bond that creates solidity and trust and rapport so that your child can always tell you what's going on with them. This webinar is for you because if you wanna show your child how to embrace their gifts and develop a deep self-motivation so that they go are go-getters, they take the initiative and they're doing things that are correct for them in the way that is an alignment with their higher self, with their life purpose, with all the experiences that they're supposed to have so that you can show your child how to be responsible and how to be independent. You know, some children's temperament, uh, they are incredible, they're just born incredibly independent and others, you kind of have to shove them out of the nest a little bit to teach them how to be self-sufficient and how to do things on their own. They're a little more shy and timid and they're not going to take that step without the support of someone who has their back and who is who loves them and who can teach them how to be responsible and how to be independent in a way that's safe. And of course, that's not gonna happen if your child never learns to listen to that inner voice that they have. And when they're listening to that inner voice, other people aren't gonna have such a powerful influence on them. And their, their friends aren't gonna be able to pressure them to do something that they don't wanna do or they're not supposed to do, <laughs> right? And by the way, that only happens when they have high self-esteem. If your child doesn't have high self-esteem, then they will let someone else lead them. And they get to a point where um, the parents are the major influencers, and they get to a point where their peers become the major influencers, and um, that's normal. And that's a normal behavior, albeit frustrating and maybe a little irritating, but when that shift happens, you want your child to know who they are and to make decisions that are correct for them and to know that if they make a mistake, they can come to you and they can talk about that with you and they can fix their mistake without this judgment and criticism so that they have to hide it, you know, because they will find a way to hide it. And that fosters such a deep connection with their child that they come to you when they have a problem instead of hiding it from you. And not only do they not hide their problems, but they don't hide who they are. A lot of times when we get judged and ridiculed, we hide who we are because it isn't safe. But whenever they have that deep connection, it is safe for them to be themselves and express themselves and figure out who they want to be and what they want to be and how they want to do those things. So today we're going to cover three secrets. Secret number one, your child literally is always communicating with you. Are you listening? Secret number two, some behavior is a cry for help. So how do you decipher what is normal and what is a cry for help? And then secret number three, how to talk to your child so that they listen. Okay, I know that's a big one, right? <laughs> Our kids are really good at talking and lecturing as parents. And our kids, they can work on that listening bit a little bit, a little better, that listening job a little better. So your children are always communicating with you. Are you listening? Because as you probably learned, just because they're talking, <laughs> talking isn't necessarily communicating. And there's so many ways to communicate. We're constantly communicating. One of the ways is, of course, body language. You know, that's a major, if you are reading your child's body language, you're picking up a lot of information, and they are too. They're reading your body language. Um, the eye contact, is your child making a lot of eye contact with you, or are they hiding? You know, that's gonna be a really big clue. Touch, we know that 
infants need touch. You know, as human beings, we need meaningful touches. And your child needs about, oh, hey, Monica, we're going to go over those needs in just a little bit, okay? So stay tuned. Um, your child needs between eight to 10 meaningful touches a day. And not just your child, but your partner. You know, any intimate friend, friend relationship that you have that you see in a regular way. What gestures are they doing? Are they rolling their eyes a lot? You know, that's gonna tell you a lot about what's going on with them. What tone of voice are they using? What tone of voice are you using, <laughs> right? Um, and this one gets discounted probably the most, mother's intuition. And this is one of the ones I'm like, you have to trust this. And a lot of people don't trust their intuition because it's not necessarily backed up by logic or you can't explain why you have this intuition. But it's a great platform. It's a great conversation starter with your child saying, hey, I'm, I'm sensing something's going on with you and I'd like to hear about it. And if your child is saying, oh, no, nothing. Okay, so it might be nothing, but I'm not, that doesn't mean, oh, my intuition wasn't right. Just keep asking them, okay, well, if anything changes or if you want to share something with me or maybe you forgot about something, but I'm picking up on it, just let me know. I want to hear what's going on with you. You know, I care about you and love you. Mother's intuition is, a, is not like this necessarily a strong pull. It can be something really gentle, a little gentle nudge, a little gentle whisper in your ear that, hey, something isn't right. And so we discount it because it's not like, wait a minute, I'm getting this huge red flag, <laughs> right? It's like, huh, well, oh, no, it's okay. I, you know, nothing's going on with them. I asked her about it and she said it was okay. So make sure that you're really giving heed to this intuition because it's a big part of parenting. Um, and what are you communicating to your child? You know, when kids see their parents hurting, they want to help their parents. Even if they don't know why their parents are hurting, you know, sometimes they don't have the understanding to, under, to know that as a parent, we have different life stressors <laughs> than our kids have. And those things are getting in the way of us communicating with our kids or us having a certain emotional state that we want to have. And so if your child senses that you are stressed, they might think that it's them. And so they create a, a distance so that way you don't have to worry about them or they might, you know, stop um, communicating with you because they think, oh, you're just stressed out whenever we talk. And it has nothing to do with your child. It's actually, you know, maybe it's a financial obligation or it's something that happened at work or it's a deadline that you're facing. And when you talk to your child and you tell them what's going on in your life, that's when they can understand, oh, okay, so mom has these things going on in her life and she's really stressed about them. And then you can talk to your child and say, you know, what I really love is how, you know, you cook dinner some nights and that would really help me, you know, and you're telling them exactly how they can support you because they want to do that. And as kids, they feel important when they get to when they get to support you the parent you know they feel powerful and there's a very nonverbal communication there's a very powerful nonverbal communication that I want to share with you that I first learned about in Stephen Covey's book the seven habits of highly effective families now Stephen Covey I don't know if you know about him or not but he had nine kids and like 52 grandkids, okay? <laughs> so this is someone who knows parenting. And he was really struggling with one of his children. He, he had a son who wasn't turning in his homework, was acting out in class, he wasn't doing his chores around the house, he was instigating fights with his siblings, and he was just really, it was just becoming a really big problem. And Stephen Covey and his wife, before they ever even had a conversation with their son, they waited for him to go to sleep. So he's completely asleep, okay? There's no, no talking going on. While his son's asleep, they go and they sit at the foot of his bed. And they 
literally just visualize and picture and project who their son is. Their son is, they projected that their son was someone who did his chores, who was respectful and kind, who cared about his siblings, who, you know, cared about his education. And within a few short weeks, without ever having a conversation, this child did a 180. He started doing his chores around the house. He started turning in his homework and his teachers were complimenting his behavior instead of complaining about it. He started cooperating with his siblings. He started taking showers. And if you have teenagers, you know what a problem that can be. He started, um, and he actually got to the point where he started his own lawn mowing business, became very organized and self-motivated. And that's the power that we have as parents over our kids. We have a huge influence over them by how we see them, our perception of them, our perspective, our, um, you know, what, uh, the way that we are expecting our child to behave, you know, has a huge impact. And so if you're expecting your child to start a fight with you, guess what? That probably is going to happen, right? And so when you as a parent remember and get in alignment with who your child is and who you expect them to be and how you expect them to behave, that is going to be the first step. And that isn't verbal, you know, and that's a communication that you're constantly showing them and telling them and you're telling you know you're telling your kids through your body language and just through your <laughs> mindset who they are and they get to decide okay yeah this is me and they start saying oh you know what my dad respects me i'm someone who is to be respected and someone who's to be respected helps and is a leader and cooperates right The another, another thing, way that our kids are communicating with us is behavior. And this is one of the ways I'm like, this is your little secret spidey sense, okay? You can always know what's going on with your kid, even if they're not telling you what's going on with them, without spying on them, without snooping on them, without stalking them on social media, right? You can literally interpret their behavior and figure out What's going on with them? Because again, when they don't have that language or they don't even understand the emotions that they're feeling, you know, whenever they go through major life spurt, growth spurts, their hormones are changing them in a really drastic way. They're growing and their brain is growing. You know, it's not just like their muscles and their body is growing, but it's their brain. They're making new connections and new associations. They're having new feelings and they have to navigate that and they don't always understand what's going on with them or how to explain what's going on with them or how to ask like, Hey, why do I feel this way? <laughs> you know, my kids will say, Oh, I'm feeling a pain in my knee. That must be a growing pain, you know, and it's just like random, you know, but they're, they have all these sensations going on as they grow. And so their behavior will be their voice. And, uh, and we're going to talk about the four emotional needs that every child has and adults have it too and when these needs don't get met they will use their behavior as their voice and so one of the major emotional needs that every person has is attention right attention is a legitimate human need it never goes away no matter how old you are or how young you are right we need attention we thrive on attention on being acknowledged and seen and valued that feels amazing and that makes us want to grow and thrive and gives us a sense of purpose and as you have probably learned if you have kids that if they're not getting positive attention they will settle for negative attention right and so if your child is acting out and you are yelling at them why could you do this how i'm so angry i'm so frustrated this is so annoying when you do this you know you're yelling all these things at your kids and you're angry you inside your child is like wow i have mom's attention she's totally focused on me <laughs> right like she sees me yay she's finally seeing me and you're throwing all this anger at your child and inside they're like 
Yay, thanks, mom. This is what I wanted for so long. <laughs> right? And we reinforce that because we do it over and over and over again. And if you find that your child is using bad attention as attention, then we have to make that shift and we have to understand, okay, the positive intent under this behavior is my child needs attention. That's a legitimate need. And I want to give them attention in a positive way. And so find time to do that. Find time in your schedule to give them that positive attention so that they know that if they need attention, they can get that from you instead of having to act out, having to misbehave. And that's the fastest way to get attention, right? But if you as a parent make a small shift and say, okay, there's this bad behavior going on. I know what's, that it's an attention need. Okay, so in, as your child's acting out, just gently saying to them something like, hey, did you get enough attention from mom today? And your child's going to be like, hmm, no, I didn't. Like, okay, let's schedule that now because I want to make sure that you get some positive attention from mom. And see how that changes the relationship, right? See how that emotional need, when that emotional need of attention gets met, Oh, it's going to have all these ripple effects. It's your child is, and then eventually your child's going to be able to say, hey, mom, I didn't get any of your attention today. I would love to spend some time with you instead of, you know, making a huge mess <laughs> that you're going to yell at them for. Does that make sense? Is that, are you getting that? Is that, have you seen that in your own life? Okay. Another emotional need that a child need has is to be in control. And if you have a toddler, you probably know that the three things you will never be able to get them to do are eat, sleep, and use the restroom, right? They will use the restroom on themselves, you know, just so that they can be in control. They will not go to sleep and they will not eat their food. You know, the food that you know they like and food that you know that they're hungry just so they can feel powerful because it's amazing to feel powerful, right? It's amazing to feel in control. And so whenever you give your child options and choices, they feel like, wow, I get to choose. And the choices you give your toddler are going to be a lot different than the choices you give your teenager, right? As, as a toddler, you can kind of give them a choice. Okay, do you, you want to take a bath now or do you want to take a bath in five minutes, <laughs> you know? And a teenager's that's going to patronize them, right? So they need different choices. They need choices that are really going to affect their life. You know, choices about social media, choices about their phone, choices about going to school and socializing and participating in different social events and parties. And so that's going to be um, ways that they can feel powerful and make decisions and choices in their own life. And as a parent, you want to be there letting the, giving them this, this ground to experiment in. You know, if they're, they're under your wing, they get to experiment with being in control and feeling powerful and making decisions and making bad decisions. And because they're making bad decisions under your wing, they're learning. You get to teach them how to fix those mistakes. And they get to learn that, okay, I can make a mistake. And even if I make a mistake, I can fix it. And it doesn't mean that now I'm never going to make a decision again, right? It doesn't mean I'm afraid to make a decision because it might be the wrong decision. It just means like, okay, if I make the wrong decision, I'm going to have to fix it. I'm going to have to face this consequence. And so is it worth facing this consequence or is there another way that I can make this decision so that I, there's less likely of a chance that I'll make a mistake? Another emotional need children has is to feel capable. You know, they need to feel like they know how to do things. And you, we see this a lot whenever kids or toddlers want to help their parents cook and wash the dishes and clean and they see whatever mommy's doing and they want to do it. They want to feel capable. They want to feel like they are able to do stuff. And this is the beginning of them becoming more independent. And it's so important, so crucial for their it's going to have all these ripple effects later on in life because if they feel like they can't do things, if they're not capable, if they're inadequate, then they are going to hold themselves back in a major way and they're not going to be independent. And eventually when it comes to that shift where the parents are more influential to where 
their friends and their peers are going to be more influential, they are not going to be the ones who make decisions and feel capable for themselves. They're going to let someone else do that. And then it's that way it can be someone else's fault. Someone else can make the decision and it can be their fault. And I can just say, hey, they did it. And that way I don't have to take responsibility because if I do, I might make a mistake. And so teaching your kid that, hey, this is the way you do this. This is the way you do this task. Like if you want to help me do the dishes, great. This is the way we do it. You have to wash the dishes and then you put them in the dishwasher or rinse them off and then you put them in the dishwasher to sterilize them. Or you fold the towels this way. So initially it's going to take more time teaching them how you want chores to get done. But eventually they're going to be able to do it on their own. And then they're going to be able to go and do more things on their own and experiment with how to get it right. And they're not going to just half-ass something because they want to hurry up and get it done. They're going to know how to get it done. And so with my kids, whenever they say, I don't know how to do that, my response is, well, that tells me you need more practice. <laughs> and so let's do the chore together as many times as it takes so that way you learn how to do it. And as a parent, it's a lot faster to just do it yourself, right? But what are we really te te communicating to our kids when we do things ourselves that our kids could be doing? You know, we're telling them that you won't get it right, that maybe you're not good enough. Maybe we're telling them, or maybe they're hearing that you, the parent, are their personal slave or butler, right? <laughs> and mom will just take care of everything. Mom will just clean up after me, and I don't have to do that. You know, and that's not what we want to communicate to our kids. We want to communicate to our kids how to learn, how to fix, and it's okay. Right? It's okay to make a mistake, and it's okay while you're learning something. You know, you're not going to learn something instantly most of the time. It's going to take practice and time. And as you practice and as you take that time, you're going to have the support of mom not doing it for you, but answering any questions you have, giving you any, any advice that you need so that you can learn how to do it yourself. And the last emotional need that a child has is to feel loved unconditionally okay a lot of times as parents when we get so angry to our kids it feels like we take our love away and a lot of times whenever I talk to parents and I ask them you know do you love your child unconditionally they always say yes right we of course I love my kid unconditionally duh you know I'm the mom, the mom I have to and it's just like this biological response inside of me I just do it you know but whenever we I ask the child does your, do you feel that your mom loves you unconditionally? They usually say something like, well, when I make good grades or when I do something right. And so sometimes there's this disconnect between what we truly feel as parents and what our kids are hearing. And so the way that we can communicate to them that we love them unconditionally is letting them know, you know, hey, no matter, yes, you made this mistake, and or say your kid is you know makes a huge mess and they're looking at you and they're like oh my god I just made this huge mess I know I'm going to be in trouble you can tell your kid I love you and I'm really frustrated about this mess but I know that you're going to clean it up and I can trust that you know how to clean it up and if you need any help figuring something out you can ask me and so we're constantly reiterating and reinforcing that Yes, you made a mistake. Yes, that's going to happen. No, my love for you never changes. It's always constant. And whenever your child is wanting to feel or know if they, you love them unconditionally, sometimes it can feel like your child is hurting you, like they're doing things on purpose to spite you or defy you. Because when they hurt you, if you have this reaction, then that is the clue <laughs> that okay, my mom does love me. My mom it doesn't have apathy for me. She isn't ignoring me. She does love me. She does feel something for me. And, uh, and that, of course, that's not optimal, right? That's not the appropriate way to show our kids that we love them unconditionally, but it does happen. Especially, we see this a little bit more whenever you introduce a new family member, you know, whenever mom has a new baby. 
in the house and the child can feel like they're not loved anymore because they're getting less attention and they're not maybe they have to you know be quiet they don't get to make as many choices as they had to in the past they have to be quiet for the baby and they have to eat at this time because of the baby and mom mom's attention is going here and there and they can't do things for the baby that they want to do and so they start to feel like they aren't loved and so they might try to find out <laughs> if mom really loves them by doing something to hurt mom and so constantly reinforcing like you know I love you and this is uh, this is not how we do things and so I want to teach you how to do that whenever we have time or um, you know my son will actually say will actually ask me do you love me you know when he's upset I'm, and I tell him I always love you that never changes I get upset I might get you know sad or upset but my love for you never changes and so that is constantly reinforcing that yeah it's unconditional I love you baby no matter what or if your child comes home and they made a bad grade on on a test telling your child look I love you and this grade needs to change and <laughs> I want to support you in getting this grade to change so does that make sense I mean isn't that awesome you can totally Figure out what's going on with your kids. You know what their needs are now. You know how to, you can pick up on all this behavior and like, oh, okay, I think I know what's going on here, okay? And you're understanding that all this behavior has a positive intent. Your child wants to know that he's loved unconditionally. That's why it feels like hurt, right? <laughs> and it's, um, it's pretty awesome whenever you get to the point, get, can get to the bottom of this. And I think this can, um, you know, this has really helped me in my life, and I hope it helps y'all and y'all's. So why is communication so powerful? Well, it's one of the ways that we measure our happiness. You know, how do we measure our happiness? By how connected we feel. And how do we measure how connected we feel? By how much we know about our kids, about our family, about our friends, about, you know, the or maybe our community, what's going on in the news. We're going to watch the news because we want to know what's going on. And so if you don't know what's going on with your kids, that feels horrible. It's like, what? I didn't even know that. You know, this big thing happened and I didn't know. It's like this gap, this distance. And it's, and you know, for me, especially as a parent, I'm sure you feel it too when that happens. It's like, what? No. And communication can close that gap. It can make you feel connected and it can form a bond that doesn't go away. That's always there and always consistent. And so I'm, I'm curious if you reevaluate the way that you're communicating with your child, are those techniques outdated? Because some, you know, I have a big gap in my kids. I have a daughter who's 19, and then my boys are 11 and 12. And so the way that I can communicate with them is a little different. And what I communicate with them is also different. You know, I can talk to my daughter about things that you can talk to a 19 year old about. Those are things I would not talk to an 11 or a 12 year old about, right? And. You can't not communicate to your child because your child has been studying your face since birth. Like your kid was like this far away from your face. You know, like you're holding your baby and he, you're, I don't know, three, maybe five years, you were like walking around holding your kid on your hip, right? And they have studied your face. Every nuance, every micro expression, every facial expression. They know what it means. They feel it. And they innately know what's going on with you, even if you aren't even as much aware of it. But understanding that all behavior has this positive intent, that's how you get to the root cause of the behavior when you get to the intent. So just want to check on y'all real quick. Okay, we're good. So secret number two. Some behavior is a cry for help. And so how are we going to decipher what is normal and what isn't normal, right? Did you know that it's normal for a four-year-old to lie, cheat, and steal? Yeah, I know. That sounds kind of crazy, right? 
but at the age of four, the brain is developing the limbic system. And the limbic system is the part of the brain that controls emotions, imagination. They can begin to think abstractly now. And they remember, you know, the spider that they saw two days ago. They're still afraid of it. <laughs> you know, and it's cool and it's awesome. But this is the beginning stages of them developing their conscience. And so they are realizing that if they tell a lie, that they can tell a lie. And that eventually the lie, the truth will come out, right? They realize that if they take from someone, how that would feel if someone took for them when before they wouldn't know that, right? They wouldn't be able to understand it. They would just know that I don't want to share my toys, you know, <laughs> and I want this toy. But as the limbic system develops, they start to be able to ha experience what other people are feeling. And so when they are learning these things, this is a really pivotal point for them because just because they're lying, just because they're cheating and stealing does not mean this is who they are, right? This is just part of them learning. And because they're under your wing and you've created this beautiful platform for them to learn about who they are and who they want to be and how it feels. You know, if your child is lying to you instead of, you know, washing their mouth out with soap, <laughs> you might want to try asking them, you know, how does it feel when you lie to mom? You know, does it feel good inside? Where do you feel the lie inside? And is that lie, um, did you know that mommy knows that you're lying? <laughs> and this is why mommy knows that you're lying. And as you kind of dissect what's going on with them, you get them to learn how it feels and what's right about it, what's wrong about it. And that's the voice that they begin to develop. Did you know that it's normal for teenagers to challenge cherished family values and become distant? They're, this is the point where family gets goes to the back burner and their peers and their friends become the main influencers for them. And that's normal, albeit irritating and annoying. It's normal and it's important. Because they need to learn those how to uphold those values when they go out into the world, when they're faced with people who don't share those values. How do they hold to those principles and defend those principles and share those principles with others? It's going to take experience. And so it may feel like your child is throwing every all the values you taught them out the window, but trust that they are doing what they need to do in order to figure out what values are correct for them and what values maybe that they're going to leave behind, what values that their friends are imposing on them and what values they're going to take and keep and discard out of those values. But they kind of have to try them on and play with them a little bit and have a, an experience in those values in order to understand that. And so how can you know what's normal? Well, you know, whenever we're pregnant, we're like, oh my God, you know, this book is a number one bestseller. How to expect, what, excuse me, what to expect when you're expecting. We all want to know, like, oh my God, what's normal? Why is my body changing all crazy ways? And you were like, okay, that's normal. Okay, that's normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it helps. And we can do that also with our kids. We can know what's developmentally appropriate based on our child's age, based on their level of cognition, right? There's also another technique that I want to share with you. If you were to categorize your child's responses into two categories, one, a loving response, two, a cry for help. <laughs> That's really going to support you in being there for your kids and showing up for your kids in a way that they need you to be. Because as our kids are figuring out what their feelings are or what they feel or how to relate to other people or how to fix their mistakes. They're going to be using their behavior. They're going to be using their body language. They're going to be um, picking up on other people's expectations of them. There's all this communication constantly going around around them that they're picking up on and interpreting and internalizing. They may not ha have a voice for it, though. And so as a parent, if you can listen to what your child is saying, and if they are sharing something with you, awesome. That goes in the loving response column. 
But if they are saying something that is mean or nasty, what they're actually doing is crying out for help. And if you, as a parent, return a nasty remark that your child made with another nasty remark, now you are both kind of crying for help and no one's getting helped. You know, when your child is crying for help, one of the questions that is really useful is, what's going on with my child for them to respond that way? You know, is this an emotional need that isn't being met? Is this my child stressed, hungry? tired you know like what is going on with my child for them to respond that way and telling them hey it's not like you to say stuff like that something must be going is something going on with you that you want to talk about or you want to share with me that's going to help your child know like oh wow I'm having these really big feelings and they may not even have been aware of how they responded or how they replied to you or what they the way that they the tone of voice that they were using and so when you respond that way, it helps them become aware of what's going on with them, and it gives that a voice. And next time, it's more like, I don't know what's going on with me. I'm just in a really bad mood, <laughs> you know? And then you're like, oh, yeah, I felt that way too. I can relate to that. How can I support you? Is there anything we can do? Do you want to listen to music? Do you want me to leave you alone? you want to be in your room for a while? Like, do you want to watch a funny comedy? <laughs> like, how can I support you? And that communication is going to be key in forming that bond with your child. And they know that they can come to you and they can share with you and that you have their back and you're going to support them. And you can only do that if you're looking at the positive intent under the behavior, the positive intent under the response. Like, what's going on? There's an emo is there an emotional need that my child needs from me that I can support her in? And when that question can really change the dynamic between you and your child, because now instead of just reacting to your child and throwing back some, a taste of their own medicine, <laughs> right? You're teaching them awareness and they feel seen and they feel loved and they feel supported. And that support's coming from you, the parent, not their peers per se. You know, it's coming from the person who loves them the most, who has their back, who has the best interest for them, <laughs> okay? And so does that make sense? You know, when we teach our child to listen to our emotion, to their emotions, that's when that awareness happens. And when they are aware, like, oh, my God, I'm just in a really bad mood, well, let's find a way for you to express that emotion so that you can, so it can pass. Okay, let's find a way that if you're in a really crappy mood, you don't take it out on the people that love you and that you love. You find an appropriate way to release that emotion. And that's going to take experimenting, right? It's not just something that it takes practice, <laughs> right? Some kids want to be held. You know, some kid, and at, maybe as they grow up, they don't want to be held. You know, I have one, one child loves hugs, okay? My other kids, they let me hug them, <laughs> okay? But if they're in a bad mood, they don't want me to hug them, you know? And that's the first thing I want to do. I'm like, oh, come here, let me hug you, let me adore you, you know? They don't want that. You know, so I have to exper I had to experiment with those kids and figure out what they wanted. They wanted to listen to music. They wanted to be alone. They wanted to just veg out, and that was okay. And I have a, an, another son, he, when he gets angry, he wants to hit stuff. So he would hit pillows, and he's graduated from the pillows. He recently asked me for a punching bag, because he's like, when I'm so angry, I want to feel like the punch, you know, and the pillow is just too soft. It's not enough. I want to feel like I'm breaking something. Okay, so boys are like that, right? <laughs> they have testosterone. Makes them a little bit different than girls. So he can tell, but he, the main thing is that he can tell me that. He can say, look, this is what I need. This is how I need, I want to express this emotion. And figuring out different ways for different kids, right? And what works for a child when they're four isn't going to work for them when they're 14, right? You know, it, it might change. And so, but constantly letting them know that 
there's an awareness there and that you're willing to experiment with them. You're willing to show them and teach them new ways that they can express their emotions in ways that are safe and appropriate, ways that, in ways that are respectful. You know, just because you're in a bad mood does not give you permission to treat everyone else really rude and mean and disrespectful. There are appropriate ways for you to get that emotion out and still care and love the people that are around you and respect them. And so the last secret I want to talk about, and I know I'm kind of running short on time. I have about 10 minutes left. So I'm going to run through this one pretty quickly, is how to talk so that your child will listen, right? Because a lot of times we're talking and talking and talking and our kids going in one ear and out the other. <laughs> All right, so a lot of times people think that our emotions are vulnerabilities that make us weak. And I have a daughter who hates crying in front of anyone. She wants to be alone. She doesn't want anyone to see her. She doesn't want to express her emotions. She doesn't like doing that and it's really hard for her and difficult for her to open up to her friends and, uh, and other important relationships that she's made because she sees it as a weakness a lot of times we aren't allowed to express intense emotions you know in emotions can be pretty intense and it's uncomfortable to be around really big emotions for really long periods of time or even short periods of time right and we we know this whenever we hear kids screaming at a grocery store or on an airplane it's like whoa you know it's intense and it has an effect on you and sometimes we're criticized for our emotions we're criticized for being too emotional or too sensitive or you know having being too dramatic but the truth is feelings they're not right they're not wrong just it, it is what it is right you can <laughs> you can push your emotions down and repress it but it's just going to persist it's only when we express that emotion does it go away and does it heal and solve whatever needs to be solved and allowing and teaching our child to fully express the emotions in a safe and appropriate way is going to be the key to to enjoying their emotions instead of being afraid of their emotions a lot of times as parents we don't realize it but we actually stop our kids from expressing or feeling emotions because when our kids are hurting the first thing we want to do is fix it. You know, I, I'm big on like, oh my God, no, my baby's hurting. No, I have to fix it here. Let mommy do everything for you. I just want you to be okay and loved and safe. And that is just a need that we have. But it's okay for our kids to struggle. And that struggle is actually teaching them how to, how to um, be aware of what they're feeling and the changes that they're going through. And it teaches them how to ask for help and how to deal with things on their own instead of only needing, you know, mom to fix everything. They learn how to fix it. And so when we solve our pro their problems for them or we rescue them or we help them too much, we aren't showing them that we trust them, that we believe in them and that they're capable. You know, we're communicating to them that they are a little less than, that they're not exactly good enough, and that they need someone else to do things for them. And then later on, we get mad because they're not independent, and they're not doing things that they should be doing at that age <laughs> themselves. When we lecture them, we're not really hearing what's being said. We're just telling them, okay, here's how you fix it. Or this is what you should have done. This is what you need to do. You know, we're not really hearing the underlying emotion that's going on. They're they're hurting, and they're sad, or they're sad, or they're angry. And let's help them express that emotion instead of just talking at them. It's not gonna it's not gonna help. Uh, if we make fun of them, if we assume that we know how they feel. Oh, I know what's going on with you. Ah, yeah, yeah. You did this last week. You know, or if we deny what they're feeling, you know, for, for your brother come, your child comes to you and is like, I hate my brother. You're like, no, no, you don't hate your brother. We're family. We have to love each other. 
they might actually be hating their brother in that moment. I'm like, oh, wow, if you hate your brother, you must really be hurting right now. You must really be upset. That does not feel good because I know that, <laughs> you know, whenever you love your brother the way that you treat him and the way that you have his back, uh, humiliating our kids, yeah, not not good, not fun. It's um, It definitely shows them that they can't express their feelings or maybe that they shouldn't even have those feelings or we minimize their feelings, oh, it's just a little bobo, you know, they're like, oh, my God, I'm bleeding blood, and you're like, oh, it's just a little scratch, it's okay, it's nothing, um, imposing guilt, <laughs> you know, that's a great way to control your kids, but it doesn't last, and it doesn't teach them to have the confidence and to feel powerful and in control, it just teaches them that other people can manipulate and control them by making them feel bad, and that tears down that confidence. We name call them. <laughs> if we interrupt them, we use sarcasm, we pity them. You know, this all teases our child not to trust themselves. You know, and if they don't put them their trust, if they never learn to put the trust in themselves, they're gonna give it to someone else and they're gonna constantly be following someone and making decisions that aren't right for them making decisions that are for someone else, right? Those are following the decisions that are for someone else. And what's worse is not only will they don't, they won't feel like it's safe to be themselves, they'll have to hide who they are. And no one will ever see them and they won't believe that anyone truly loves them because no one ever sees them. They've always been hiding. And so how can we support our kids? We can listen intently, you know, really listen to what is going on with my child for them to be feeling this or saying this and asking them like, oh, really? How does that make you feel? You know, how did you feel when that happened? You might think they were really angry, but what they actually were is hurt. You know, just when we listen, we get these little clues and then we can truly support them. And we can understand them and we can relate to them. Yeah, I know what that feels like. Oh, I think I know what you're talking about. That's happened to me before and that does not feel good. And get curious, you know, like, is this the first time you felt this way? Is this something that's been ongoing for you? Because I want to know, like, what's going on? So to make sure that we support you. And if you're not supposed to solve your child's problems for them, but you can ask them questions um, to help your child solve their own problems. So asking, what would happen if you shared your toy you know, with your brother? He would break it and lose it, and I would be angry with him forever. Okay, well, what would happen if you shared another toy with him? Oh, well, well, I guess... I could share this one, you know, and just getting them, asking them questions so they get to decide and they get to become aware. The feeling of being understood and accepted is crucial in helping children work through their emotions because if they get stopped before they work through their emotions, then they just hold on to it and they'll persist. So today we have covered secret number one, your children are always listening. <laughs> Are you? They're always communicating with you. Are you listening? Some behavior is a cry for help, how to decipher what's normal, and how to decipher what isn't normal, and how to talk to your child so they listen. <laughs> okay, I hope y'all enjoyed that. I'm going to stop sharing and take some questions. Okay, so just to reiterate, you probably already know this, but just to reiterate, the um, four emotional needs that every child has are attention, the need to feel powerful by being in control, the need to feel capable, and the need to feel unconditionally loved.
Okay, so what else do we have? All right, Monica says, oh, I can sew that when my daughter is tired. Oh, are you so tired and that is why you're behaving like this? What else can I say when she is all over the place with her outbursts in the evening? Oh yeah, so just ask her, you must really, you must really be upset to be behaving this way. I'm curious what's going on with you because if I can support you, I want to do that. And um, you can say, you know, Monica, you can say, oh, you're so tired. That's why you're behaving like this. But asking a question is actually even more, even better, you know, or telling her, I'm curious if you're behaving like this because you're so tired and you need help going to sleep. And if I can help you by like massaging you or playing, drawing on your back or maybe reading to you or singing you a song, I, I can help you go to sleep if that's, if that's what this is. Um, so Jill's asking, if you don't do this when your kids are younger, how do you start implementing it when they're older? So th that's a great thing. Like all of these techniques and all of these things work on adults, <laughs> right? They work on your partner. You can use it with coworkers and friends also with, with other family members. And if you haven't done it whenever your kids are younger, you just start. Like literally you just start and you practice and you start telling your kids, hey, I, I know that you love me and that this behave, but this behavior, I can't tell that, <laughs> you know, like, and I want to, I want, and so I know something must be going on with you because normally you treat me with a lot of respect and love. And so that is something that you can start doing. And even with your partner, you can just start, you know, you probably haven't talked to him or her that way, but you can just start saying, hey, is this, um, is something going on with you? I'm sensing that something's going on. And if I can help, I want to, you know, I want to support you however I can. Um, and Nathan wrote in here, unconditional parenting, moving from rewards and punishment to love and reason by Alfie Khan is another great read too. Oh yeah. Awesome. There's tons of great books out there. So thank you for sharing that, Nathan. Please do, and he also wrote, please do as I requested, only if you can do so with the joy of a little child feeding a hungry duck. Please do not do as I requested. If there's any taint of fear of punishment, if you don't, please do not do as requested to buy my love. That is hoping I will love you more if you do. Please do not do as requested if you feel guilty, if you don't. Please do not do as requested if you feel shameful. And certainly do not do as I request out of any sense of duty or obligation. Marsh, and that's a quote from Marshall B. Rosenberg. Oh yeah, I love that. Um, Nonviolent communication. And that's one of the things that I got certified in whenever I was um, working for Victims Outreach for the University of Texas. So yeah, that's really cool. I love that. Thank you for sharing that, Nathan. Awesome. And Jill says, this is great. This is something I'd love for my whole family to work on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> totally. And the, the thing that's so incredible is that your whole family doesn't have to work on this. It literally starts with one person. It can start with you. And just like Stephen Covey and his wife did, they never even had a conversation with their son. They literally sat at the edge of his bed while he was asleep. And they just projected and visualized who their son was. And he started to change because their expectations of him changed. Their perception of him changed. And that's literally all it takes. It doesn't take anyone else doing anything. You know, it's literally you. You have the power to communicate so many positive expectations to them in so many positive, respectful ways. And it's not just using our words. It's using our body, eye contact, touch and the way that we perceive them. Monica says, thank you, I will do my best. I am also tired in the evening. It's good, is it good to share that? Yes, absolutely. And so letting your child know what's going on with you because your child knows something's going on with you, right? They've been studying your face since they were born. 
And they also have intuition. They're also picking up that, hey, mom's stressed out. Is that because of me? Well, wait, if mom's stressed out because of me, does that mean she loves me? Well, let me hurt my mom. Let me act out or misbehave to see if my mom loves me, right? And these are inappropriate ways, but they get a need met. And so telling your child, um, hey, uh, hey, you know, at nine o'clock, I am going to be so emo so tired and so drained. I need to be alone. I need to do this by myself. And so I want to spend, I want to make sure that you and I get our one-on-one -on -one time together before that happens because after, you know, nine o'clock, I'm probably just going to fall asleep and I'm not going to give you the attention that I want to give you or I'm not going to show you the love that I want to show you. And so letting her know, like, this is our timeline. You know, this is the deadline that we're working with. <laughs> Let's try to find sometime and as your child gets older that's going to change like my boys i give them attention pretty much every day for 20 to 30 minutes we'll watch something together we'll do something but i'm i might be massaging their feet while we're watching something or we're having a conversation about something or we just go somewhere together my daughter who's older whenever she became a teenager she didn't need that one-on-one -on -one time with me because her friends were more important but every week we would go on a date together and I would take her out and that was our time to talk and catch up and reconnect and just re cement that bond that we have. And, um, and so definitely letting her know what's going on with you. Like, I'm really tired or man, I had a really bad day today, babe. Uh, what do you think I should do at work? Or what do you think, how do you think I should plan my day so that this doesn't happen again? And getting her input, Monica, she's going to feel like, wow, my mom respects me. My mom wants my feedback. My mom wants my opinion. And she's going to, you're going to be able to say, see how she can contribute. Um, I have friends that do think your webinars are only for toddlers and small kids. A tip is to use pictures of teenagers as well. <laughs> yes, thank you, Monica. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah, this does work for all kids, all ages. And again, it works on your adult partners, right? These are I just the language that I use and the words that I use are more for small children. But totally use this on your loved ones and you know, ask your partner. Um, you know, if they say something really nasty to you, then you can say, you know, reply to them. Wow, you must really be hurting to say, to talk like that to me. What's going on? You know, and when they hear that, then I mean, they become aware like, oh, wow. Yeah, I didn't mean to say that to you. I'm so sorry. I did have, a, I did have something happen today and the, the, and it opens up that communication and they start talking and you start, you know, that gap, that distance starts closing and you feel connected now you know what's going on and now you when you, you now you're happy right because how are we judging our happiness based on our relationships so all right y'all thank y'all so much uh just as i love your work i'm excited to learn more oh thanks still monica she forgets about my suggestions about our time together from 8 to 9 p.m but she forgets how to talk about those. Oh, that's a great idea. So if she's forgetting, set a timer. You know, I'm guilty of that too. As a mom, I forget like, oh yeah, we were supposed to, you know, we scheduled some time together and I forgot and now I'm really tired. So then, that, then that's a conversation. So either I'm going to say, okay, I'm really tired, but I made a commitment to you. I'm going to keep that commitment because it's really important. Or if my child is like, hey, I'm really tired too. Why don't we just like go lay down together or why don't you draw my back for a little bit? Then I'm like, okay, cool. Let's do that. <laughs> right. But your child is, you know, it, of course they're going to forget, you know, that happens to all of us. And so that's okay. And letting her know like, Hey, whenever we schedule our time together between eight and 9 PM, we forget about it. Why don't we schedule our time earlier? So that way we do it right away. Cause I want to make sure that I adore you with attention and I make sure that you feel loved and acknowledged by me. And this time that we've chosen, we keep forgetting about it. So as soon as you get home from school, let's make time to do that or let's find another time in the day to do that. So that way, if we don't do it at that time and we forgot, now you have 
that uh, that eight to nine o'clock window where you can say, okay, we're going to do it here. Oh yeah, we forgot about it. Okay, let's do it. And um, and sometimes you know if you forget about that window, it's not doing maybe what you were originally planned. Maybe it's doing a chore together. You know, maybe like with my kids, sometimes the way I'm spending time with them is folding clothes with my son, you know, he's in charge of the laundry, or doing the dishes with my son, he, the, my other son's in charge of the dishes. And so we're talking and I'm passing him dishes, you know, or I'm passing him hangers so he can hang up the clothes. Or I pick up some towels and together we go put up the towels in the restroom. And so we're spending time together doing their chore because, you know, things got a little sidetracked. But definitely, um, I would ask her, Monica, I would say, because we keep forgetting I'm curious what you would want what you suggest because this is really important you know this is a great this I'm, I'm not able to show you all the love and affection that I have for you when I'm so tired and I want to as your mom show you how much I love you and care about you so what do you suggest you know should you do you think if we moved the time that would help or you know get some feedback from her Oh, and I love this. And Sue says it will work with self-care too. Yes, it will. And that is really important, right? The more aware you are of what's going on with everyone else, you're also going to turn, the ripple effect is going to have that self-awareness, what's going on with you. Um, Olga says, so good. Thank you so much for sharing. And Sue says, no guilt, no shame, no fault, lots of forgiveness, compassion, and loving kindness in the process. Yes, absolutely, totally. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate you all being here, and I hope this helps, and um, you all get a lot out of it. I will see you all later. Bye.